In the previous video, we looked at uh, nucleocapsids and the different shapes of those, those capsids. Uh, the nucleocapsid is simply the capsid combined with the nucleic acid together. And what we want to do now, we said that a virus has to have a nucleic acid and a protein coat, the capsid. Bare minimum, anything less than that, you don't have a virus anymore, right? Um, but what sort of optional equipment is there? What, what sort of accessories do we see on some viruses? So we're going to talk about viral envelopes. And this is not an uncommon accessory. A rough, rough estimate is that maybe half of the viruses that infect humans are enveloped and maybe half aren't. The envelopes themselves come with a set of what are called glycoprotein spikes. And we want to talk about the role of those. And then some viruses will also carry with them some of their own enzymes. Now, if they're carrying an enzyme, that means that the gene that coded for that enzyme was found on the viral nucleic acid. And during the process of viral replication, which we haven't gotten to yet, inside the host cell, that enzyme was being made and it gets packaged inside the capsid along with the um, along with the nucleic acid. So let's talk about this sort of optional equipment or accessories that we see relatively commonly among various viruses. So an envelope is a lipid bilayer. It's truly a phospholipid bilayer. It's a membrane. It has virus-specific proteins on the surface, and it surrounds the capsid of some viruses. So for example, in this image of a herpes virus here, um, they've shown, they, they intentionally were able to break apart the, um, the envelope. And you can see the envelope sort of busted open, like it looks like an egg yolk almost. And on the inside, I guess that would be the egg white, right? So here is the edge of this viral envelope, but it's busted open. And that's why it's sort of splayed out the way that it is. And the image is showing here our symmetrical virus capsid. You can see individual capsomeres. You can't see the nucleic acid. It's inside someplace, right? Um, that envelope is relatively common and it, for a given species, it's required. So for example, if you're an influenza virus, all influenza viruses have an envelope. You're not gonna find some influenza variants with it and some without. It's not optional at that level. For a given species, if that species requires an envelope, then each virion, each individual virus unit, uh, has to have that envelope. And the main reason it has to have it is that on a naked virus, okay, so let's go up here and say we've got a virus that has no, has no envelope on it, that naked virus is going to have attachment fibers, sometimes called tail fibers, that are essential proteins for attaching to very specific host cells. In other words, th these fibers help the virus to find and detect the cell type that it knows how to infect. And hopefully that makes sense, right? A virus particle doesn't have a flagellum. It can't swim. It, it can't undergo chemotaxis and move towards something or away from something. It just drifts around. And if a virus is designed to infect liver cells and that virus is bouncing around in the intestinal tract, then that virus shouldn't ever attach to those intestinal cells and try to work its way in. Because if it does, it's not going to know how to, how to commandeer, if you will, or hijack those cells. Right? So individual viruses have very specific host cells. We call it host specificity. And that host specificity is determined by these tail fibers, okay? Host specificity is determined by these attachment or tail fibers. When you've got an enveloped virus, there are on the capsid no tail fibers, okay? I just made that up, that's not there. Instead, there are virus-specific proteins that are in the envelope. And since this envelope came from the last host cell, that means that while the virus was replicating itself inside the host cell, it also had to make these proteins and insert them in the membrane of the host cell so that when it exited and took some of the membrane with it, it had all these virus-specific proteins on the surface. What do we call these proteins? Sometimes they're glycoproteins, glycosylated proteins. We call these spikes. And the main purpose of the spikes is attachment. 
Okay, so on a, on an, a naked or non-enveloped virus, we have tail fibers or attachment fibers. Both terms mean the same thing. Tail fiber or attachment fiber mean the same thing, okay? And their job is to attach the, the virion to the very specific host cell type that they can infect. On an enveloped virus, where there's an envelope wrapped around it, that job of attachment is given to these glycoprotein spikes that are found in the membrane. Because if there were tail fibers attached to the capsid, they'd never be able to come into contact with anything because they're wrapped up in this envelope. So in this picture of uh, a helical version of an influenza virus, you can see the helical capsid, and it's a, one of the flexible ones, right? It's formed a tube. There's an RNA on the inside, and then there's this membrane all the way around it with spikes on the surface. And when we talk about influenza in more detail, we'll see that there, in addition to attachment, there are a couple other functions for some of these spikes. But attachment is the most important role for the spikes that are found in an enveloped virus. All right, and then finally, enzymes. Some virions contain a limited number of crucial enzymes. Remember, they don't have any metabolism. So we're not talking about glycolysis enzymes or anything like that. These are enzymes that are key to their life cycle. So um, which one do I want to look at first? Let's look at number two, nucleic acid polymerases. The RNA viruses, think about this. An RNA virus shows up. It's got a piece of RNA on the inside and it needs to make more of that RNA once it gets inside one of your cells. Well, what enzyme do you have that could do that? Here's the question, can your RNA polymerase read this molecule of viral RNA and make more copies? Can your RNA polymerase read this molecule of RNA and make more copies? I'll tell you the answer is no. When you think about in human cells, in human cells, RNA polymerase takes a double-stranded DNA molecule and makes a single-stranded RNA copy. In other words, human RNA polymerase is DNA dependent. You get that? Think that through. Human RNA polymerase is DNA dependent. There's no DNA in this RNA-based virus. So an RNA shows up. Your RNA polymerase cannot read RNA and make more RNA from it. And therefore, RNA viruses are going to package with them an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that can take a single or double-stranded RNA, whichever it happens to be, and make RNA copies so that the cell can make more... Uh, the, the virus, the cell can make more virus for the, okay, let's try that again. The cell can make more RNA on behalf of the virus, which can then make more protein to build the capsids, etc. right? And you got to make lots of copies. If you're going to, if one cell is going to burst at 300 virions, you've got to make 300 copies of that RNA. And it's going to take a viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase that can read an RNA template and make more RNA. Human RNA polymerase needs a DNA template to make RNA. I hope that makes sense. So some will bring their own nucleic acid polymerases, uh, especially the RNA viruses. Um, let's look at neuraminidase real quick. This is an, uh, an alternative spike that we see. For example, in influenza, neuraminidase breaks down parts of the human extracellular matrix. We don't have a cell wall, but we have these fibers of polysaccharides and proteins that are adding some physical structural support to our various tissues. Those fibers can really impede uh, the ability of a virus to either get in or even more commonly to get back out again after they've replicated inside a host cell. Neuraminidases are enzymes that would be found as spikes. Neuraminidases are often spikes in envelopes that will help essentially dissolve away little patches of the extracellular matrix so the virus particles can get out. And then finally with phage. Many, many phage carry an enzyme called lysozyme. And lysozyme does just what its name implies. It lyses bacterial cells. Remember phage need to inject their DNA 
across the complex envelope of a gram positive or a gram negative, and they got this great big thick peptidoglycan wall in the way. Lysozyme can chew a little hole to allow insertion of that DNA. More importantly, lysozyme is often used so that when uh, as many virions as possible have been made, a couple hundred virions have been made inside a bacterial cell, the cell wall doesn't keep them trapped in. Lysozyme is, is released, it chews up the wall, and the cell bursts or lyses, so all the phage particles can get out and go attach themselves to another victim. So there are, in fact, some possible viral enzymes. These are three classic examples for you. All right, in summary, many viruses have an envelope. Keyword here is many. With spikes that are primarily used for attachment, but we saw in the case of neuraminidase, there's another possible use there for some of the spikes. The envelopes originate in the host cell as part of the cell membrane. They're literally stealing cell membrane from the host cell as they exit. Some viruses, especially the RNA viruses, can bring one or more of their own enzymes and in particular their own RNA-dependent RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. When you watch the video on retroviruses, you're going to see retroviruses are kind of a weird subcategory of RNA viruses that also have to bring some of their own funky enzymes. Um, because of their unusual way to replicate. All right, hope that was helpful. Hope you're following along, and I'll see you in the next video.